This is the IELTS listening test. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four parts. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Now turn to part one. Part one, you will... You will hear a conversation between a woman clerk and a customer at a cell phone store. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six. You will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this example will be played first. Good morning. What can I help you with today? Well, I've just moved here and I need to get a new cell phone number. OK. We've got both prepaid plans and 24-month contract plans. The woman clerk says there are 24-month contract plans. So, contract plans has been written in the space. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Good morning. What can I help you with today? Well, I've just moved here and I need to get a new cell phone number. OK. We've got both prepaid plans and 24-month contract plans. I'll only be here for a year, so I think a prepaid plan is better. Can you tell me something about those? Of course. We've got a number of different plans. But first of all, I should just mention that none of them come with handsets. You'll just be buying a SIM card and you can replace the one in your old phone. Yes, that's perfect. So how much are the SIM cards? Well, the expense isn't really in the card. To use it, you'll need to set up a plan, and that can range from just over $10 a month upwards. The card itself is just $2, and that gives you about 15 minutes of local calls. OK. I knew I'd need a new plan from you guys, but I don't have much money at the moment. Can you tell me about the cheaper plans? Yes. Our least expensive is the minimal plan. That's only $12 a month. That's good. But it's for someone who doesn't use their phone very much. You only get 40 minutes a month of talking time. Ah. How about internet access with that one? No, sorry, that's not included. No, no, that plan's not for me. I'll definitely need to go online. For browsing the net? Or for things like Facebook and WeChat? Mostly social media. It's how I keep in touch with people back home. Well, we do have what we call a social plan. That might really suit you. You get unlimited data on social media websites. That sounds great. How much is that one? That's $40 a month. But you get 200 minutes of talking time, 500 texts and 2 gigabytes of data, which is about 15 hours of watching videos and thousands of photo uploads. <laughs> well, I do upload lots of photos for my friends back home, so that's fine. But I'm worried that I'll need more text than that. Do you have any plans with unlimited texting? Well, there is one other plan. On that one, you choose five people or five phone numbers and you can talk to or text them as much as you want. That's called the friends and family plan. OK. That sounds like the one for me. What's the catch? Well, it's not exactly cheap. That plan costs $70 a month, but it does come with three gigabytes and unlimited texts, as well as your five designated people. That's a bit too pricey for me but I do like it. Can I choose a cheaper plan now and change after I find a job? Oh yes, you can just come in and let us know whenever you like. It's also possible to log into our website and manage your account yourself online.
Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Okay, I think the social media plan is the best option for the time being. Great, so we'll set you up today. We'll just fill in the sales form. Here's your new SIM card. I'll just need to record the number for you. Can you read me that number on the top left-hand side of the card? It's your new phone number. Uh, yes. It's zero four seven eight double seven nine two double three. Okay, I got it. So remember, that's your new number, so you should write it down as well so you can inform your contacts. Hold on to this package that the SIM comes in. There's information on that about how to contact us, you know, just in case your phone gets lost or something like that. Oh yes, that's important. So next, I'll need your name. Sure. It's Stephen. That's Stephen with a V. And my surname is Conway. That's C-O-N-W-A-Y. Okay, that's cool. And your address, please? Well, at the moment, I'm living in temporary accommodation. Once I've found work, I'll be moving to a different place. Do you think that matters? Well, not really for now. But please let us know when you get a permanent address, okay? Yes, fine. So I'll give you my current address for now, then. It's 375 Thompson Avenue. Is that spelled T-H-O-M-P-S-O-N? Yes, that's right. It's in Green Park. Ah, yes. Okay. So the total for today is $42.50. That's the SIM card and the first month's plan. So just to confirm, I'll be able to get the SIM card today and start using it immediately? Yep. You've got the SIM card already. Oh, yeah, right. Sorry. Now, let me see if I have enough cash. Uh, 10, 20, 30. No, it, it doesn't look like I have enough. I guess I'll have to put it on my credit card. Here you are. No problem. Just a moment. So just sign here, please. Now, do you want help putting the SIM card into your... That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part two. You will hear a receptionist, Doreen, talking to a group of parents about the Daisy Daycare Centre. First, you have time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Hello everyone. I'm Doreen, the receptionist at the Daisy Childcare Centre. Thank you all for coming to our open evening. I'll just show you round and tell you a bit about the place. First of all, I will have to ask you to leave your sneakers and sandals etc. here on the shoe rack, just inside the main door. You know how the young ones love crawling around the floor, so our policy is no street footwear inside. As you can see, our facility is very open plan. There are lots of different activity areas, and we like to have pretty good visibility throughout the centre. This central area to the left is where we all gather for stories, songs and some games. That's why the big circular carpet is there. 
everyone comes to sit there two or three times a day. I can see some of you looking at our TV. Some parents worry that we might just dump the kids there to watch rubbish all day. But of course that's not the case. In fact, we only use it occasionally. For example, we use it if we have a story on a DVD. And then we get the kids to do a bit of acting based on that. That bookcase there beside the TV gets a lot of use, though. Some of the older kids choose to sit and read or look at picture books in their free time, but we never allow them unsupervised TV. If you look along the wall on the far side of the little gate leading into the main room, you can see our kitchen play area. It has lots of utensils, pots and pans. And that cupboard closer to the corner is the dress-up cupboard. That's a very popular area with the boys as well as the girls. You'd be surprised how much the boys get into acting and make-believe. Now over here, opposite the gate and behind the big lunch table, are the sinks and the painting area, and then the doors to the outside. To the right of those outside doors, you can see hooks and little cubby holes on the wall for coats, bags and outdoor shoes. The children can keep slippers in there, but most of them run around indoors in their socks or bare feet. If you can bear it, I think we should pop out into the cold for a moment to have a look round outdoors. We'll just stay under the veranda. The sand pit is over there at the far left of the outside area, and that box next to it is storage space for buckets and spades, and lots of trucks and diggers to push around or even ride on. The slide beside that is popular, and so are the three climbing walls over by the fence. Some parents think that's a bit adventurous for preschoolers, but the older ones love them. The ground is covered with bark, so it's not a harsh surface when they do fall. The ordinary swings and a tire swing are here in front, where we can keep an eye on everyone, and then the chickens are way over on the far right, so they can have a bit of peace and quiet occasionally. OK, so let's go back inside, and I can talk about our rules and policies. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. As you probably already know, the government sets limits on adult-child ratios but we try to improve on those wherever we can. There are different ratios for under and over two-year-olds. For the under twos, the rules are one adult to four children, and we basically stick to that, except that we have an extra roving staff member with no allocated children who helps out wherever there's a need. The older kids have a one to eight ratio, and again, we try to have an extra staff member on site. All of our staff are fully qualified, but we do have trainees from the local polytech at certain times of year. We do have pretty strict rules about pickup times here. It's a real problem if parents are late and we end up with far too many kids for the number of staff. So we ask you to be very punctual about collecting your children. We have had to ask a couple of consistently late parents to leave, but of course this is only a last resort. We have quite a long waiting list here, especially for the over twos, but you're welcome to put your name down. The average lead time is usually about nine months, but sometimes we get unexpected vacancies. For example, maybe a family has to move to another city for work or something, so their child is withdrawn. This means, if you're lucky, your child could be admitted in three months or so. Now, are there any questions? That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part three. You will hear a conversation between a science tutor and two first-year students who are being given some practical tips for conducting experiments. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25.
Listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Now, Vincent and Tessa, I've asked the two of you to come and see me because I'm a bit concerned after that incident in the science lab last week. I realise that neither of you have had much experience in a laboratory before? Well, we mostly just studied theory at high school. And we rarely got the opportunity to carry out any experiments. Fair enough. But we must all abide by certain safety procedures. The last thing we want is for one of our students to get hurt. We understand that. Our priority is to make sure that the chemistry laboratory is a safe place and actually, accidents can easily be prevented if you just think about what you're doing at all times. It sounds simple enough. It is if you always use good judgement, observe safety rules, and follow directions. We've read the rules on the poster inside the lab. And yet last week you were seen working in the lab without eye protection. What do you mean? I was wearing my glasses. Prescription glasses are not safety glasses. You must always wear the goggles provided. You'll find they fit quite comfortably over your ordinary glasses. Oh, I see. Just make a habit of putting them on before you start and keep them on until you are finished. And another thing, never eat or drink while in the laboratory. What? Not even water? Not even water. At least not until after clean-up. Then be sure to wash your hands thoroughly with soap and hot water and dry them on a clean towel first. And Tessa, your hair should be tied back when you're in the lab. It's not that long. Still, it poses a hazard when you're working with chemicals or a naked flame. If you can't tie it back or pin it up, see if you can tuck it into a cap or something. Yes, I can do that. Thank you. Now, Vincent. Last week, you wore a T-shirt and trainers in the lab. The rules clearly state that long-sleeved shirts and leather shoes must be worn. Oh, yes, I remember. I was late getting back from sports practice and I didn't have time to change. Well, it mustn't happen again. OK, I'll see that it doesn't. Good. As for the rest of the safety precautions, refer to the safety poster inside the lab and you shouldn't have any problems. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Now, before you go, a word about record keeping. Oh, good. I was going to ask you about that. What's the best way to keep track of what we're doing in the lab? Well, obviously, all your observations should be written down. I know you think you won't forget stuff and you'll be able to recall it later, but generally this turns out not to be the case. Written data, however, are a permanent record, and you must be thorough. Organise and record everything in a bound notebook. I use a spiral notebook. And I use a large notepad. That won't do. A book with binding ensures the pages are not easily removed or lost. Oh, and be sure to write your entries in complete sentences. Isn't that a waste of time? Surely notes are good enough. You might think so. But brief notes can be hard to decipher at a later date. Whereas with full sentences, you are less likely to misinterpret data. I make sketches, you know, simple drawings. That's a good idea, Vincent, but be sure to date them. You want us to write the date next to each drawing? Yes. Every sketch and every entry must be dated. What about headings? Use the title of the experiment as your first entry. When you have completed your observation entries, answer any questions that have been posed, and then, finally, write your conclusion. How do we write a conclusion? Do we need to repeat things like the questions and our findings, or the time it all took? Just write your own ideas or feelings about the experiment as the conclusion. Oh, and remember to sign it. 
Well, that's all I have time for today. If you have any questions, ask the lab assistant or come back to me. That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three. Part 4. You will hear a talk on the importance of soil in organic agriculture. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Welcome to this talk on soil science and organic farming. Dirt, soil, earth, loam, mud or dust, it doesn't matter what you call it, is of primary importance in the production of food and other crops. Most people think of it just as a substrate or medium in which plants grow, but it's more than that. It's actually a living entity or it should be if it's healthy, and human health is affected by the health of the soil. Healthy, living soil is literally crawling with life. There are the obvious earthworms, which burrow in the soil and help to aerate and improve it, beetles and other hard-backed insects, and various invertebrates like centipedes. Then there are fungi and bacteria, also living forms. Healthy soil needs food, air and water to help plants grow and the more nutrients in plants, the more available for humans and livestock. It stands to reason, therefore, that plants grown in poor soil will have few nutrients to pass on to the consumer, whose well-being will be worse off over the long term. So, where do plants get their nourishment? Most of it comes from the soil. Some nutrients are made up of minerals from the earth, while others come from dead plant and animal matter which is broken down over time by the living insects and other organisms in the soil. Plants depend on these little living creatures to convert minerals and other vital elements into a utilizable form that can be taken up by the plants. And it's a synergistic relationship. In turn, the plants assist those helpful organisms by releasing sugars and enzymes back into the soil. Before I go any further, let's take a look at the structure of soil. Now, if you look at the diagram, you will see that soil is made up of many different layers. Let's start at the bottom. This is the bedrock under all the other layers. The layer above that is called regolith. Here, the bedrock is slightly broken up, but plant roots don't penetrate this layer. Moving up the chart to the next layer, we come to the subsoil, which contains clay and mineral deposits. On top of that is the alluviation or leaching layer. This is quite light in colour and is mostly just sand and silt. As we get near the surface, we find the topsoil. You will hear a lot of talk about topsoil amongst farmers and other agriculturalists. It's the most important layer of all because it's where seeds germinate and roots grow. Now, at the top of the chart, you will see a comparatively thin layer. This is organic matter that is still in the process of decomposition. It mostly consists of leaf litter and humus. Just think of the surface of the forest floor. Partly decayed leaves and twigs, that sort of thing. As you can imagine, good soil forms very slowly over time, but it can be lost very rapidly through erosion. And, in addition, soil quality can be affected by pollution due to anything from industrial waste to the artificial fertilizers used by conventional farmers, which have been shown to suppress the diverse life forms in the soil. This is why organic agriculture is the way of the future. Let's take a quick look at the conventional system, which is often based on monoculture, the production of a single large crop. It relies on chemicals for fertilizer and pest control. 
It is also becoming an increasingly common practice to use genetically engineered seeds. And more chemicals are used to control insects and fungi which attack crops in storage and during transportation. Also, did you know that there is no requirement for conventional growers to maintain records of their production practices? Organic growers, on the other hand, choose the most environmentally friendly options for dealing with pests and disease problems, working towards prevention in the first place. Some of the strategies they employ include alternating the crops grown in each field, as opposed to monocropping. Because different plants add different nutrients to the soil, by rotating crops, the soil is naturally replenished. This can do away with the need for pesticides, because the problem insects' life cycles are naturally interrupted. Surrounding crops with green waste can not only conserve moisture in the soil, but it can prevent weeds from springing up and it also feeds the beneficial microorganisms. When it's ploughed under, it feeds the soil by building more organic matter. Organic farmers often release beneficial insects as predators, which precludes the need for artificial pesticides. Animal manure, combined with green waste materials correctly composted to kill pathogens and weed seeds, fertilises the soil in a way that encourages life rather than suppressing it. And, by the way, use of manure in organic farming is highly regulated. In fact, all agricultural inputs are evaluated for their long-term effects on the environment, regardless of whether they are synthetic or natural. To sum up, Organic farming is the only sustainable way of feeding the people on this planet and keeping both the planet and the people in good health. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four.